Welcome to the next video in the Local Ecosystem series. This video is going to cover a few dot points that are fairly straightforward and they all tie in together really nicely. So the first one is define the term adaptation and discuss the problems associated with inferring characteristics of organisms as adaptations for living in a particular habitat. Identify some adaptations of living things to factors in their environment and identify and describe in detail adaptations of a plant and an animal from the local ecosystem. So let's start off with the definition of adaptations. So an adaptation is a variation that an organism has in order to help them survive in a particular environment. So this last bit is really quite important. So it's not just a variation that an organism has from one individual to another. It's an, a variation that has to help them to survive in a particular environment. And we'll explain what I mean by that as we go through uh, the video and have a look at some examples. So there are three types of adaptations that plants and animals can have, and these can be broken into categories such as structural, behavioural and physiological. So starting off with structural adaptations, these are adaptations to do with the way that an organism's body is built, so therefore its structure. So it can relate to things like its colour, its size, its shape, what type of body covering it has, just as a few different examples. So if we have a look here at this wolf, Okay, we can see that it's got a strong nose, it has sensitive ears, it's got thick fur, a tail, a quite thick tail that helps it balance and its legs are quite muscular to help it move quickly. So all of those things are structures that help that organism to live within the environment that it, it does uh, reside in. So Two Australian animal examples. The first one is the platypus. So we know the platypus is quite a unique organism. Okay, so it's got a few features that when the platypus was first sort of observed, they weren't sure where exactly it fit in. In particular is this bill. So the platypus has a very flat, very strong bill. And what actually they use that for is to dig in the mud of the riverbeds and that stirs up the food and then they can eat. They also have a very flat and broad tail, which helps them to steer through water and they actually have quite sharp claws, again, to help them dig and to protect themselves from their predators. Dolphins are another ex ex a great example of structural adaptations. They have what we call a streamlined body shape. So as we can see, their body or their nose comes to a point and then it gently opens up to a wider point in its midpoint. Okay, it's the surface of its... Um, body is quite smooth as well so that really helps the dolphins to move easily through the water okay as we said water is quite viscous so by having a streamlined shape they're able to move through quickly some plant examples again uh, a particularly australian example is a eucalyptus tree so eucalyptus leaves have very are very long and skinny they're also very tough so they have a waxy cuticle on the surface and these adaptations help to reduce water loss. So we know that eucalypts usually live in environments where it's quite warm, and not a great deal of rainfall. So they need to have quite a few adaptations to make sure that that water is conserved. Plants that live on the floor of rainforests have really broad, flat leaves. Okay, so they have a very big surface area that's able to com uh, to capture as much sunlight as possible because they're living beneath the uh, balcony the balcony sorry the canopy of the rainforest any sunlight that comes through needs to be captured in order to um, help the plants undergo photosynthesis the second type of adaptations is behavioral adaptations these are changes to the way an organism behaves sorry acts or in other words behaves so it's pretty straightforward behavioral is their behavior what do they do how do they um, carry on so there are many different things that can fall under this heading, including burrowing, the use of mating calls, parental care, so the way that they look after their young, and migration, just to name a few. So we can see here, birds will actually migrate from cooler climates to warmer climates during winter in order to um, find those warmer temperatures. Same with whales. So again, some uh, Australian examples. You'll soon quickly um, realise that Anytime we ask you for examples of animals or plants, we are asking for Australian examples. 
Uh, so here we go. We have a kangaroo. And what this little kangaroo is doing is he's actually licking his forearm. So between his paws and his sort of elbow joint is quite thin skin. Uh, so kangaroos don't actually sweat. So by licking their forearms, as that water evaporates, it takes that heat from their bloodstream away and helps to cool them down. Just like dogs that will pant when they're hot, uh, this is the adaptation that kangaroos have to deal with uh, heat. So snakes, any type of um, snake, a brown snake, a red belly black snake, they will bask in the sun when the temperature drops in order to maintain their internal body temperature. So unlike mammals, reptiles can't control their internal body temperature. So when the temperature outside drops, their internal temperature drops. So in order to deal with that, they'll go and lay on a nice warm rock or as you may have seen if you've ever been out driving in the bush, uh, on a nice piece of asphalt like a road to really absorb as much heat as possible. Some plant examples. So plants are a little bit trickier to see how they behave because we usually associate behaviour with animal uh, instincts and things like that. But two examples in particular, the desert peas, which are definitely an, another Australian example, will only open their pores at night, again, to reduce water loss. So the fact that they're desert peas mean, obviously, they live in an environment where there's little water. So by having the little pores on the surface of their leaves only opening at night means that they're not going to suffer from a lot of evaporation from the extreme heat from the sun. Now, sunflower is not typically an Australian example, but it it is one of the uh, easiest examples to really visualise of a behaviour in plants where they actually appear to follow the sun in order to capture as much light as possible. And flowers will also open and close their petals at, in day and night, which also can be considered, can be considered to be a behavioural adaptation. Now, the last of our three adaptations are our physiological adaptations. So these refer to how the organism functions. And these can be the hardest ones to identify because they are internal adaptations. They're usually to do with some kind of process that takes place beneath the surface of the skin. So biochemical processes like keeping our blood sugar levels, our carbon dioxide, water, all those levels correct, uh, increasing, decreasing our heart rate, opening and closing our blood vessels, all those things come under physiological adaptations. So again, some animal examples. Our little bilby here, another great Australian example, they live in the desert and obviously there's not much water there. So the bilby's kidneys have adapted to be able to extract water from everything that they eat to reduce the need to find water. So obviously water is quite scarce. So their kidneys are really, really specialised and really are able to make sure no water or as little water as possible gets excreted from the bilby. And animals, including humans, obviously, uh, will sweat when they're hot in order to lower their body internal body temperature. So some animals can't sweat, so they have adaptations to deal with that. But we obviously can, and that really helps with our internal body temperature because if our body temperature goes too high, it has massive flow-on effects that can actually make us quite sick. So plant examples, the Sturt Desert Rose, which is this one here, has seeds that are covered with chemicals to prevent them from germinating until there's rain. So again, when a seed first starts to grow, it needs lots of water and lots of nutrients in order to provide it with the energy that it needs to get through that, that first growth stage. So if there isn't any water available in the environment, these seeds just won't germinate. They'll just stay seeds in the ground and then once the rain comes through, the chemicals are washed off and the germination process takes place. So on the excursion, we looked at two organisms in particular in relation to adaptations. The first one, uh, or one of the two that we looked at was the mangroves, and the second one was the ringtail possum. So there's a number of different adaptations that mangroves have in order to be able to survive in their environment. So we saw that the environment that the mangroves lived in was very heavy, waterlogged soil. Uh, so the plants obviously aren't going to be able to extract oxygen from that soil because it's just got so much water in there. So one of the main adaptations that we saw with the uh, mangrove was these little snorkel roots called the pneumatophores. Okay, so they, 
they're those ones that popped out of the soil and look like little um yeah little snorkels and they have tiny little holes on them called lenticels and that allows the oxygen to go into the root and then it travels up to up the plant in order to be able to um carry out respiration and other things that it needs to do we also looked at uh, adaptations to do with salt uh, in particular with the leaves so the leaves are able to undergo salt elimination okay where uh, if you had a look at the leaves and if you actually taste the underside of the leaf so the lighter side of the leaf you would actually taste quite a strong salty taste so the salt is pushed out through the stomata on the the leaves and then through the heat from the sun the water is evaporated and the salt crystals are left behind then when the rain comes through uh, the rain then washes those salt crystals away and the mangrove tree is happy another adaptation the salt has uh, sorry the mangrove has to deal with salt is salt exclusion which again happens in the roots or our pneumatophores so the pneumatophores are able to stop it between 80 and 95% of the salt from the water from entering. Okay, so uh, the, the salt that does enter then is dealt with through uh, salt elimination. Okay, the third one that's not on this picture here that we talked about was salt accumulation. So the leaves are able to accumulate salt. So the plant will pick particular leaves that it will sacrifice. The salt will be pushed into those leaves. Those leaves will turn yellow and then fall off after they're full of lots and lots of salt. So a couple of other adaptations that the plants have that we talked about is their um, viviparous, which means that as soon as the seed falls from the tree, it germinates automatically. It sends up a shoot and those little leaves that we saw on the seedlings are able to photosynthesize straight away. And they can stay at that stage for quite a long period of time. And then depending on competition, whether there's enough room, whether there's enough resources, whether there's enough light, those seedlings can survive for up to two years before they either die or they develop into a fully grown mangrove tree. So mangroves are really quite um, special in the way that they're able to adapt to the area that they live in. In that estuarine or uh, intertidal zone, they're constantly inundated with salt water and then it goes out again. It comes back in twice a day. They would be sort of under a decent amount of salt water. And over time, they've really developed these specialised adaptations to help them deal with that. The other organism we looked at was the ringtail possum. Uh, I know our group was lucky enough to be able to see one of the little possums inside its dray. Uh, so a couple of adaptations that we talked about that ringtail possums have is firstly they're nocturnal, so they come out at night to try to stop being caught by their predators. They build drays which are just like nests that they can cover themselves up. They build them high up in the trees, so it really keeps them away from their predators such as cats and foxes, which they said were the two main um, introduced predators as well as the powerful owl. So the powerful owl moves around in the trees, but uh, with the dray, the possum can put a top on it so it really does protect them. Also, living in family groups helps the possums, they just keep an eye out for each other. As we can see from the picture, they have really quite large eyes and that helps them to draw as much light in at night through the process of refraction as possible. Their fur is a grey brown colour on the back and their belly is quite light, almost white fur. And that helps them to camouflage against the trees. So when they're up in the trees, the white helps them blend into the sky and the grey helps them blend in with the trunks of the trees. Another adaptation is they have quite sharp claws, which obviously helps them climb trees. Their uh, digits also move in quite an interesting way that's very different to humans, which helps them to grip and to move around. They are marsupials, so they're from the mammal group but then they are marsupials, so they have a pouch. The young are born very early, so they're very small. Obviously, the, um, the adult possums aren't that large. So by giving birth to very small young, it's not going to put a lot of pressure on the mother in order to carry them around. And by carrying them in the pouch, they're able to develop and um, grow without being threatened by predators as well. 
And lastly, the most sort of interesting adaptation about these guys is their tail, which is where they get their name from. So their tail is extremely long. It's quite muscular and it helps them to grip onto trees. It also helps them to grip onto other things when they're moving around or when they're feeding. So that brings us to the end of this video. Um, and so thank you for watching.